What is God calling you to? Is it connecting with God through reading His Word or falling on your knees in worship and prayer? Maybe He's asking you to join a community or begin that ministry He put on your heart. How do I take the next steps from just attending church to becoming an active member of the body of Christ? What does it mean to become fully transformed in the image of Christ? Whatever it is, let us press on, press toward, and let us press in what God has called us. I'm going to hold off a little longer. <laughs> Good morning, Colonial Woods. How are you doing this morning? If I would have done that any sooner, you guys would have blasted right out the back doors. I could tell. Hey, look at somebody near you and say, you look phenomenal for a mid-January morning. Do that, would you? You look phenomenal for a mid-January morning. You're saying, what in the world does that mean? We live in Michigan. <laughs> it's just, uh, isn't it nice? It's just getting a little bit of snow outside. Yesterday I was outside walking in the fields and stuff. There wasn't a whole lot of snow. And I got to tell you, when you're in January and it's kind of mild, I take it. I just take it and I, I enjoy it. If you're joining from home, I want to say welcome to you as well. If you have your Bibles, turn them to uh, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to continue a series uh, that we've entitled press in press in it's about pressing past all the distractions all the disruptions that keep us from going into the holy of holies where we find uh, grace and mercy in our time of need and we're talking about entering into the presence of God and we're just simply starting the year that way but all year we're going to keep coming back to this idea of being in the Lord's presence and hope you'll continue to go on that journey with us well, I don't know how many of you go get back into the gym when you start the first of the year and you maybe go to a gym. And I, I used to go, I mean, I went a lot. There was probably 10, 12 years in a row that I just tended to make that a part of my life. Um, with COVID, I kind of switched it a little bit and I did what many of you did, which is developed a gym at home that I don't use. And um, that's kind of that's what I'm doing with it now. But uh, I keep telling Tammy, I make excuses. I don't really need to get on the elliptical uh, because uh, I, you know, I hunt a lot and I'm out walking not enough uh, my 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 apple phone keeps telling me you're not there yet you're not there yet that's kind of it but um i was talking with somebody this last week about the nature of working out and how we're here in the gym you tend to gravitate toward the the exercises or the the weights or whatever it is that you you like and i happen to feel like we like them because our muscles are developed in those areas. For example, if you tend to really love cardio, you probably have a fairly well-developed legs, but also a well-developed uh, 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 cardiovascular system. And I used to always like the Stairmaster. I like the Stairmaster because it emphasized these muscles right here, and I've got fairly good quads, and so for me, it was always a good exercise. And I hated, though, the ones where I had to do the reverse presses where you do your legs because they hurt. And I hate what I feel like after I do that. And you know, some guys are always working out their chest. Some people work out their, their, their biceps. And the problem is there's this little phrase that says, don't skip leg day. Because if you only focus on one area of your body, you end up like this guy here. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem. And you know what? If we did a little comparison, some of us would be like that, right? We got, we got I heard this yesterday, I kind of liked it. Is that guy, are those his legs or is he riding a chicken? <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of a thing. And, and the thing is, there are guys that are like that, gals that are like that. They're really well developed in one area, but not in another area. And we get off balance. It struck me because I find that some of us are the same way when it comes to the things of faith. We tend to press in in the areas that we're most comfortable with, I would dare say that you're gifted in. I, for me, I love the Word of God. I have a, a teaching gift, I have a leadership gift, and I have a, an exhortation gift, which is kind of a motivation gift. Those are my stronger gifts, and because of that, I think I naturally, as a believer, gravitated toward the Word. Some people tend to gravitate more toward prayer 
because in their life, they have a faith gift. They may have a, uh, even a healing gift or an intercessory gift, and for them, it's a much easier avenue. In fact, in our last church, I had a guy that uh, said to me one morning, I, I went up to him, was talking about the message, and, and at that time, I was probably preaching like 45, hour, uh, 45 hours a week, 45 uh, minutes in the service. We had about an hour and 15 minutes service. And I said, uh, man, I don't know how I'm going to get through everything today because I just, I love teaching the Word. And, and he said, Pastor, he said, I wish we would just forget about the songs and you get up and just teach for an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. This guy's name was O.J. And I said, uh, not that O.J., different O.J. And um, I said, O.J., I said, you know what's interesting? There are a whole bunch of people in this room which wish that I would just keep it to five minutes and we'd spend the rest of the time in worship. There'd be another time where there'd be individuals who say, Pastor, why don't you just talk for five minutes? Let's spend the rest of our time in prayer. There'd be another group that would say, Hey, Pastor, why don't you just go right ahead and, and preach for only five minutes? We'll spend the rest of our time fellowshipping and sharing what God has been doing in our life. All of these are avenues into the presence of the Lord. We need community. We need the Word. We need prayer. And, and so we feel like sometimes we gravitate. So if you find yourself gravitating, that's okay. Now, just because you gravitate to an area of giftedness doesn't mean that you aren't responsible for developing the other areas. It's real simple. Jesus tells us that we are to train ourselves in righteousness, that through constant use, the, the book of Hebrews says, that we develop these things in our life through constant use. It's the idea of exercise. And so I'm responsible for developing community, for developing a heart for all of these things because Jesus did all those things. And if I, if I only focus on one area, I'm going to look like the guy on the screen. I'm going to be very one-dimensional in my faith. But all of this is about coming into the presence of the Lord, not out of obligation. This is not an obli obligatory type message. It's just an invitation to come near. So let's go on a journey here. You're going to notice there's a relationship in Hebrews chapter 4 because last week we talked about coming before the Lord into His Holy of Holies. We, we came through all the tabernacle. We came right into the Holy Holies and we talked about how prayer becomes an avenue for that. But now I want you to see this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the Word of God, say that with me, the Word of God. Say it again. The Word of God. I love that. I love that. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even into dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. There is no break in the original Greek. We put these little breaks in there for our sake so we know where to go. Go right into the next one. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone before us through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, well, we have one who is tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may find mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, you might be thinking to yourself if you were here last week, well, wait a minute, Pastor. You used that one last week when you were talking about prayer entering into the Holy of Holies. Yeah, because prayer and the Word are not exclusive that the way into the Holy of Holies into His presence is in a myriad of ways. Notice what he says, by the way, about the Word of God. The first thing I notice just as an observation is that God wants His Word to be alive in us, in me. In fact, I said that really wrong. He declares that God's Word is living and active. That's not a, that's not a, you know, that, that isn't subjective, right? He just says it is living and active. But what he's really saying, I think, also as a challenge, or my application is, but he wants it to be living and active in you. So when we say the Word of God is living and active, it means that living, it is alive, it is relevant. It is amazing to me 
how something, I was just reflecting this morning on this in my prayer time, how something that was written by a guy 2,500 years ago, 2,800 years ago, is just as alive and relevant to me today as it was 2,800 years ago. Totally different culture. He certainly didn't live in the Blue Water area. He certainly, he wasn't driving cars. He wasn't going through any of that stuff. And yet, isn't it interesting how God's Word meets us right where we're at? So it's living and active. Find anything else in all of human creation that when they wrote it down, it just makes sense, right, wherever you're at. This is God's Word, and it, that's one of the beautiful things is that it's living. It's, it's relevant into my life today. That when Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary. Anybody here ever been weary? Anybody here ever needed rest? He, he uses that Word to speak right to our hearts and promise what He wants to do in our lives. But it's not just living, relevant, over the course of hundreds of years, but over just the short course of my life. How I might read the Word of God in a passage in one point of time in my life, and a, a year later, God will apply it and speak totally differently into my life. The Word hasn't changed. I've changed. And God's Word is relevant even to that. It's powerful. So it's relevant, it's alive, and it's active, meaning this. God's Word is never intended to be cerebral. It's transformational. God doesn't edify you simply to read the Bible just so that you can feel good about what you know or to be somehow cerebral about who God is. It always is supposed to have a transformational impact in our life to change us. The Word of God is living and active. The question is, is the Word of God being allowed to be living and active in your life? Number two. The Word of God exposes areas that we aren't even aware of in ourselves. Notice what he says. It penetrates. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. You almost could, it uses the word double-edged sword, but, the, but the, the concept there is like a scalpel. It penetrates even into dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. By the way, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. And so when I'm in the Word of God, as the Word of God is living and active as it's speaking into my life, God will begin to reveal things in me that I may not even have realized that I had an issue with. I've told the stories over the years of multiple times, but at times in my life where I would have told you, I, I didn't think that I had a pride issue. And yet as the Spirit of God working in my life, in the Word of God, as I began to be in the Word, He began to address some areas of my life that I didn't even realize were issues. There are some of you, in fact many of you, that when you were in the Word of God or maybe somebody was talking about the Word of God, all of a sudden you became aware that, man, I don't think I've ever trusted in Christ for salvation. Probably a lot of us can do that. And it was in that moment, living and active, that you stepped across the line of faith because it was something in your life the Spirit of God through the Word of God revealed and you didn't even realize it was an issue up until that time. And we could go on and on and on. I've told the story over the years. I was reflecting just this last week of how God began to deal with me with anger areas in my life. And it was when I was actually studying the Bible that, and, and going to be preaching on why am I so angry, I was going to do a whole congregational thing, that God began to reveal some areas of my life that I had anger that I didn't even realize I had anger. That's the Word of God. That's the power of God's Word. The third thing I observe is that the Word of God ministers to the deepest part of our lives. Notice what he says. It penetrates even into dividing soul and spirit. 
Now, we could get into a wonderful theological conversation of which about two-thirds of you would probably check out of if we got too much into it about the dichotomy of man or the trichotomy of man or whatever it is. But notice what he says here. When you're in the Old Testament, he tends to speak about, let's just put it real simple this way. Our soul is the part of us that nobody can see that is the eternal aspect of who we are that is able to commune with God. But you get into the New Testament and the author says, but there's actually a distinction there because there's a distinction between our soul and our spirit. He would say our spirit is the eternal aspect of the ability to be able to commune with God and our soul tends to be a different aspect. And you might be saying to yourself, who cares? Well, here's here's why I would say we care. God knows the deepest part of who you are that you don't even know yourself and He's able to minister to it. He's able to bring healing to it. He's able to awaken things in you that you didn't even realize were there. So not only does God know you like you know yourself, He knows you better than you know yourself. Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my, anybody know? Soul. Why? Because sometimes the deepest part of me, who I really am that nobody can see, and sometimes I don't even understand myself, is broken and needs to be mended. And the Word of God is able to minister at that level. That's incredible. Now you're saying, why is this important? Pastor, last week you told us that we needed to enter into His presence through prayer. What's interesting is that prayer and the Word work in tandem and cooperation. Scripture says that all Scripture is God-breathed, meaning carried along by the Holy Spirit. Second t- uh, Peter chapter 2 says there's not a single passage of Scripture that was written down just because people decided to write it down, but people wrote, prophets wrote, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So what's interesting is that when we pray, we're supposed to pray in the Spirit. Now get this, when I pray, God begins to help me understand His Word better. Last week, I had at least two or three people pull me aside and they said, you know, Pastor, I really struggle understanding the Word of God. And I get it, right? I get it. I'm not critical. In fact, I don't want to be critical toward people. Sometimes we get a little critical because other people don't enter His presence the way we enter His presence. We can get almost a critical spirit. God gifts us never to discourage the body. God gifts us to be an encouragement to the body always. And so as I began to pray, there'll be passages of Scripture that God will just kind of bring to life. In fact, it's interesting what it says. What is it? 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what, by what God has in store for those who love Him. But we know because we have the Spirit of God, for the Spirit reveals even the deep things of God. So what's interesting, I've shared these stories with you that I'll be in prayer normally with other people. And I'll say, hey, I was praying with a group of folks the other day, and as I was praying, boom, something came alive in me regarding the Word of God. I can pull out my phone and I can show you over and over and over emails to myself, texts to myself, um, uh, Word documents or, or note documents to myself that came while I was in prayer with other people where God helped me take a passage of Scripture and it just made sense to me. You're saying, Pastor, why? That's terrible. You were in prayer. Why would you write it down? I got a simple answer because I forget stuff. I would encourage you that if you're in prayer, keep a notepad or keep your phone there, not for other people to be distracted. But when God gives you something, write it down because first of all, you won't forget it. Number two, it won't distract you anymore. And so while I was praying, something comes alive. And so when I'm in prayer, I would dare say to you, if you want to be a student of the Word, you're not going to be a good student of the Word if you aren't 
in prayer. Because God helps us to understand His Word. You're saying, well, then why should we not pray more than, than be in the Word? Oh, what's interesting is that when I'm in the Word, it helps me to pray. And it's amazing to me how many times I'll be in prayer and all of a sudden the Lord will just bring a passage of Scripture to me that is the Word for the moment. And in that moment, I just began to pray. Great example of that is in our first uh, prayer gathering of the year, one of the guys was saying that uh, uh, I don't, I love uh, New Year's because it's a fresh beginning. And uh, my dad doesn't really care for New Year's because, you know, he feels like it's an artificial thing in there. And uh, we were just kind of laughing back and forth about it. We go into prayer and all of a sudden what started coming to me, all these passages of Scripture that talk about how God's doing a new thing. God, you call us to, to sing a new song. Lord, you're bringing us into new birth. Uh, if anyone is in Christ, he's, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And I said, Lord, I have no idea if you like New Year's, but I know this, you love new. And you're making all things new in us. And as I was reflecting on the Word of God in prayer, it just ignited my prayer life. And so when we're, when we're talking about being a student of the Word, it means we're in prayer. And when we're in prayer, we need to be a student of the, of the Word. Are we catching this? So let's talk a little bit about, about how, what the Word of God is in Scripture. I want to give you some word pictures of how God describes His own Word. The first one is that the Word of God is a GPS. It's a GPS, not a global positioning system. It's God's positioning system where He helps us to understand where we are at and where we're headed and where we need to be. In fact, he even keeps us kind of uh, in line, so to speak. Psalm 119 says this. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I, I could have used it this morning. We always keep lights on in the house when we leave the house. Today, Tammy shut off every light. I was coming out of the back room. I turned the light off, and I was, I was, she was in the van or the, the, the Honda already. And so I started walking through the house. I turned off the light, and she had turned every light in the house off, and it was completely dark. And I started to walk by Braille. You know how you're, you're just trying to find the right spot? And I think, I think there's a post right there, and, and you start to kind of walk that way. And it, when it's dark, it's hard to see where you're going but he says God's word is like a lamp unto my feet a light to my path I have taken an oath I've confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws I have suffered much preserve my life O God according to your word Understand that when we're in God's Word, God's Word becomes for us the sword of the Spirit, but He becomes the way that God is able to speak and direct our lives. When we drive to Indiana, and we've made that trip a hundred times, Tammy likes to drive with the, the GPS on. It's through our phone. You guys use that, the map or whatever. It's, it's, uh, everything's now through my phone. And so we just hook it up to the car and it comes up on the screen. And, and I, I've often said to her, Honey, I know the way to Indiana. I don't need that. Although I do miss my exit quite, quite a bit when we're talking, but, but for the most part, I know how to get to Indiana. I just simply take 69 over to Lansing, make the turn. If I'm paying attention, I hit the 69 uh, loop off to the right-hand side so that I head toward Fort Wayne, and then we take various ways to get down there. I, I know how to drive to Indiana. I've done it a few times. She said, no, 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 I use the GPS because I like to see what the speed limit is. Now, i got to be honest with you. I like the 75-mile-an-hour speed limit. My wife loves the 75-mile-an-hour speed limit, but I like the 75. But what I don't like is how it keeps going up and down. In fact, if you're on 69, I still haven't figured it out. 75, 70. 75, 70. I mean, I... I, I, no, I, I I kind of feel like sometimes they're trying to catch me. And there are many times that I think they have secretly snuck all the speed limit signs off the highway because I like to drive essentially the speed limit or within reason of the speed limit. Sometimes I'll go one or two above because I like to be able to be friendly to the police officers when I drive by. I don't want to avoid them. I don't want to act like I don't see them and I don't want to be nervous all the time. So I wave at them and all that kind of stuff. Of course, they then pull me over because they think I'm weird, but that's a whole other thing. 
The GPS keeps me on track, but it also lets me know how I'm doing. God's Word helps me to see my direction, helps me to see where my location is, helps me to see when I'm off track. So if I'm trying to navigate things in life like conflict resolution, sexuality, By the way, that was God's idea, but it isn't my thought that determines my sexuality. It's God's Word. He gives me clarity on that. I don't even have to pray about it. Doesn't mean I don't pray about it, but I don't have to pray about it because God gives me clarity on these things. By the way, marriage and family, my view toward finances, lifestyle and values, worship, All of these things, God gives me clear passage. And so when people say, well, you know, we really need to pray about this, I'm not trying to be facetious, but no, we really don't. We might need to pray for courage to follow what God's Word says, but the fact is, is God's Word is really clear on this stuff. Now, sometimes God's Word isn't super clear. It It doesn't get specific. For example, God doesn't tell me what kind of car to buy. God doesn't tell me what kind of a house to build. And I know, I know all the little jokes about, about you know, how it does do that. He, no, no, seriously. God's Word doesn't give me clarity on all that stuff. But what He does is He gives me principles that I can follow. And so when God's Word is very clear, those are the things that I need to be a little bit dogmatic on, right? It's, it's truth. On the things that where God's Word gives a little bit of lead, then, then don't be dogmatic about something that God's Word isn't dogmatic about. It's a GPS. The second thing that we see in Scripture, it's kind of a word picture, is that God's uh, Word is a sword. It's a sword. And we already talked about one aspect of that because it's like a little tiny mini sword where it becomes a scalpel. So we don't really need to look at that again because the Word of God begins to be like a scalpel into my life. But notice what it says that God's Word is a sword, which means it becomes a weapon. And here's why. Ephesians chapter 6 says it this way, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand then firm, with the belt of truth. Now, let, let's see what that passage says. That is actually a military slash wrestling term, which means that I am going to get myself ready for battle. And he says, there's going to be a day, and people say, well, we're in that day now, or maybe you're approaching that day, or maybe you've walked through a day like this, where you feel like you're under attack for things of what's right and wrong, and for, for literally standing for things of truth. He says, I'm going to give you the equipment to stand your ground, to dig in, to say, this is the line, no further than this. This is the front line. I'm going to give you the ability to do this. So this is all about standing and he begins to talk about how to stand against the enemy and as you get down to verse 17 notice what he says take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit I love this the helmet of salvation is the assurance that I am a child of God the uh, the uh, (laughs) how do I say this The, the 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 confidence in knowing that I am Assured of my faith in Jesus Christ gives me confidence to stand. But then he says, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. I love this. He says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God that we have was authored by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3 says all Scripture is God-breathed. God-breathed. 2 Peter says what? As carried along by the Spirit. 
So when I'm reading God's Word, I'm reading His will, and it becomes a weapon to be able to stand against false attacks. Jesus modeled this wonderfully. Matthew chapter 4, He's being tempted in the wilderness. What did He say? The Word of God says, it is written, it is written, it is written. Because He understood that the Word of God becomes an avenue by which the Spirit of God strengthens our resolve. And then notice how he tied it together with praying in the Spirit. It even enabled us to know how to pray. The Word of God is a sword for your life to stand. It's a GPS to know how fast you're going, whether you're in bounds or out of bounds in the direction you're to go. The last one, it's a refreshing, recharging station. I'd encourage you to read Psalm 119. Eight times he talks about the truth of God's Word. Five more times he says, I'm going to trust in your Word. Over and over he says it. But here's what he writes. He says, My soul is completely discouraged. I lie in the dust. Revive me by your Word. Almost every translation uses the word revive. Because God is able to take our discouragement. God is able to take our soul. God is able to take our confidence. God is able to take every aspect of our life and He's able to revive. It means to bring back to life again. To charge it. One of the biggest concerns, some would call it a criticism. I'm just going to say it's a challenge that has to be addressed. But the whole thing about electric cars and stuff, and I'm not going to argue it, man, they're kind of cool. But everybody acknowledges you've got to have an infrastructure that supports it. You've got to have recharging stations. Currently, the best place to do it is at your home. You get one of those little conversions and they put in this whole thing and you can charge them there. But, but what are you going to do when you're on a trip, right? You've got to have them. And so, so we, we all acknowledge there's got to be a way to recharge because we wear down. The psalmist says, God, your word recharges me, replenishes me, revives me. I'm going to enter His presence. Enter His presence through His Word. Enter His presence in prayer. But God, here's the thing. This is not an obligation. This is not one more thing you have to do with your day. No, 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 no. That's not what this is. It's an invitation. God is inviting you into the holy place. He's inviting you into His presence. He's inviting you to the promises and the mercy seat where we find mercy in our time of need. He's he's inviting you in and He's providing the ways for us to come into His presence. We gave you a, a tool in your bulletins. It's just one way. Maybe that's too much for you. Maybe the commitment you make is just spend five minutes a day in God's Word. Grab one of the daily devotionals we have out there. Just grab one. If you're already in a devotional, can I challenge you? I'll be honest, they usually give you like one or two verses. Maybe the next challenge is taking those verses, read the full chapter before and the full chapter after. So you can get some context. Maybe you need others to help you in the journey. So step into a study or a Bible study or maybe a small group of individuals say, hey, we're just going to start. See, for some of you, you're looking at this and you're thinking, this is so trivial. Oh, no. These are initial steps that lead to a deeper sense of His presence. And oh, by the way, those of you who love the Word and you dig into the Word, the application this week is meditating on the Word, begin praying the Word, and asking, Lord, make Your Word living and active in me. Father, You never share this stuff 
to deter our faith or discourage us in faith. You always are inviting us. The whole story of all of human history is you want us to commune with you. And so Lord, Spirit of the living God, Help me to take those steps. And as I take those steps, bring your word alive to me. This week I'm praying, Lord, there would be a truth that jumps out at me that speaks directly into my life. Help me, Lord, even apply this into my life of prayer. And Lord, bring me into your presence. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.